So, okay, let me start. So yesterday we discussed uh, some uh, GRBs. Today I want to focus on the uh, afterglow of this uh, merger event. And actually we have a lo local expert, Resmi, here. She is very familiar with this uh, GRB afterglow. So unfortunately I, I need to leave tomorrow, so if you have more questions, she can uh, answer further. Okay. So yesterday, let's uh, let me describe it, what we discussed yesterday. So yesterday we just uh, talked about GRB that occurs a few seconds after the merger, and duration was also one second or something like this. And we were thinking, so maybe there is a jet, and may maybe some uh, shocked material moving to a wide angle, and we are probably see some of axis. And uh, probably this gamma ray burst was produced by this jet, and we saw this gamma ray off axis, or some shock material moving toward us, emit gamma rays, and we saw this. We don't know which is uh, the answer. And uh, if you remember this Doppler transformation exercise, if this is true, the E peak sh sh seems to be too high. But uh, you can always argue, you can do some argument that maybe the off axis jet is the solution. And now, today's topic is uh, so this is just, let's say, the 10 to the, how much? 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 centimeter? Still, uh, the outflow size is quite small. And today, our uh, discussion will be afterglow. So afterglow is uh, something, so this material expands, let's say. So jet is expands, for example. After a while, the jet scale, this size is very, very small compared to the radius of the jet. So it's something looks like a shell. And also you have a, this is jet. Some, uh, this wing as well. This is also traveling. And actually this uh, material is traveling inside some interstellar medium, not in the complete vacuum. So we have uh, some uh, interstellar medium here. So this expansion, expanding material interacts with this interstellar medium and then because this velocity is too fast, it forms uh, shock. Again, here it's a shock. So the behind the shock, this is the, just the interstellar medium that uh, interacted with the, this expanding shell. And this material is accumulated with time, and then the afterglow is the emission from this shocked material. Because this shell is already very cold, but we have very, very hot shocked material uh, when they interact with the very high velocity material. And usually, for usual GRB, we are supposed to be, we are looking at the jet just the on axis. So you are looking at the, some afterglow from the jet. Then what we see usually is uh, T and flux. This decays as like power law, something like this.
This is shocked by jet, but uh, there are three components I'm talking. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but let me in show you the full picture. So I have a jet. I have a, okay. We actually, after this event happened, we didn't know really there is a jet. But let's say there is a jet. So we have jet, and we have also the mat ejector material just shocked by jet, accelerated by jet. So this is shocked ejector. Oh, sorry, shock ejector shocked by jet, the cocoon here. This is a say cocoon. So in this picture, this is cocoon. So this material is also expanding. And there is also just the ejector which didn't interact with cocoon or a jet. So this is just the ejector. So I have three components at least. So jet and uh, cocoon and uh, non-relativistic ejector, I would say. 0.2c or something like this. This, is, this ejector produced kilonova. So, hmm? okay, I, I, I am discussing this. <laughs> Just uh, let me talk. And then, here yeah, is a slow ejector, let's say. Behind this uh, material, slow. The slow ejector also interacts with ISM. So, that's why we have uh, several. Uh, But this goes like different velocities. So for example, the shock, this shock, shocked by the jet, goes like gamma, much larger than unity. And here, the cocoon component, say, gamma, maybe a few. Cocoon is the, okay. Cocoon, so jet propagate inside the ejector. So this is, this is before interacting with the ISM, just the jet is interacting with the ejector. And then this jet forms a bow shock inside the ejector. So the cocoon is called this uh, shocked region. So this is cocoon. This is also moving outward. And slow ejector is basically the mean velocity, probably 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 C. So in principle, there are several components that uh, produce the shock between uh, ejector component and the ISM. So, And if you look at the GRB and then follow up with the X-ray and optical radio, you see some power low light curve. So for example, this is X-ray and yes, time scale between uh, this happens and this happens. Uh, let's say, Okay, yeah, I will, I will explain later, because it's a bit complicated, because uh, after a while, this is, uh, goes like self-similar solution. In this uh, self-similar solution, you don't really have a scale. So it's a sort of, that's why we see power law, not like uh, uh, some, uh, with some scale. So the flux, light curve, flux as a function of time look like power law, and also, the spectrum look like power law. Let's say F nu, something like this. So maybe here is a radio, X-ray, some power law nature. So afterglow usually has simple power law in light curve and the uh, spectrum. So this power law nature you know, because of this power law nature, we have a sort of very good uh, standard theory of the afterglow. 
So the standard theory of the afterglow is uh, using this shock and then try to explain this uh, power law nature. So let uh, me discuss. Uh, The growth theory. So, if we want to explain this kind of, uh, in particular, this uh, wide power law spectrum, you need some non thermal uh, process and uh, very some power law. Power law distribution of electron emits some uh, power law photon spectrum. And what usually, in a standard theory, so this is a sort of uh, based on our experience of uh, GRB afterglow and also supernova remnant. So if we have shock, so let's say this is jet. And here is ISM. So ISM, in ISM, the shock wave pro propagates. And what happened is uh, the behind the shock, so let's say this is a moving velocity V, uh, let's say gamma. Uh, or, OK, <laughs> behind the shock, you have uh, energy dissipation. The kinetic energy goes to the internal energy. Or kinetic, kinetic energy. Sorry, I should use uh, this one, internal energy. And uh, from our experience in this uh, kind of physical shock, we have, uh, let's say, we have a particle acceleration and uh, magnetic field amplification. So I have an amplified magnetic field here, maybe something like this. Magnetic field outside. So interstellar medium also has some magnetic field, which is be behind the shock, it amplified. And also particles, electrons are accelerated, particle acceleration. So E minus get us some uh, High Lorentz factor, the unity. So usually we do is some assume some uh, equipartition between the electron magnetic field and the protons. So the energy of the accelerated electron. So this is EE. So let's say. For example, some fraction of the internal energy. So we introduce some unknown phenomenological parameter, epsilon E. And also magnetic field energy, epsilon B. So some, some, part, some fraction of the internal energy goes like accelerate particle and the internal magnetic field in this uh, behind the shock. Now, you know, if you consider, if you know this process that if electron is moving in magnetic field, there should be some radiation. So, in, so this configuration, we expect uh, some synchrotron radiation. So given EE and EB, we can calculate uh, how much synchrotron radiation I expect. So in afterglow theory, there are two very two important, important, two important things to understand. First of all, how this shock evolves with time. So this determines the evolution of the internal energy and how much energy we have behind the shock as a function of time. And second important thing is how this configuration radiates synchrotron radiation. If you understand these two, you can calculate the uh, afterglow light carbon spectrum.
Yes, we, we. How is the fluxion? Uh, I think uh, extra afterglow, 70, 80, in a Swift short JRBs. I don't know how many short JRBs Swift have detected. Uh, maybe, yeah, some good fraction of the short JRB we see X ray afterglow. And only five for radio afterglow. And optical uh, may be doing uh, this X ray and uh, radio. What is the reason why the magnetic field amplified? Yes, it's a, it's a very, very uh, big field. You ha we have very big field of plasma astrophysics that if you have particle acceleration, this uh, magnetic field is also amplified in this, uh, you know, turbulence be beyond, behind the shock. These high energy particles sort of self-produce the amplified magnetic field. So this is a... Also, there is a very big community on this topic, so I'm not expert on this uh, particle acceleration and uh, uh, magnetic field amplification, but uh, maybe uh, someone knows some this particle acceleration process. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, unfortunately, we, we we don't really know what is this. So what we are, in usual afterglow theory, what we do is uh, write down all the light curve and uh, spectrum feature with these unknown parameters, and then get these parameters from the observations. So it's very nice to have these parameters before we fit the data, but uh, in reality, we are using this uh, sort of free parameter to fit the data. And these, of course, shouldn't exceed the unity. So let's first uh, look at the, the scale of this uh, shock propagation inside the ISM. So this is a very simple, uh, so we call this the blast wave. And this blast wave, so you have explosion at, at some time, and then this, yes. Flux, flux, freezing. Yes, it's, a, it's related to the, yes, it's a, probably related to the, Feel the strings. Uh, you are saying the flux uh, conservation from here to here. Yes. Yeah, probably what we see. Uh, yes, you, you can, you know the, the how much density compression from here to here. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, you can, one way to calculate is, uh, if you know the magnetic field outside the shock, then you know how much compressed. So you can calculate what is the magnetic field at least you have. On top of that, you have some amplification. Yeah, usually you can't really apply MHD to this problem because this is a uh, involved particle acceleration, so you can't really do... Yeah, it's pl plasma, you have to solve the plasma. And uh, yes, and uh, interestingly... Yeah, yeah I, I can tell one thing, interesting thing. The, for the, this gravitational wave event, actually the magnetic field behind the shock seems to be very low. You can maybe explain the just compression of the magnetic field, but we don't know the exact value of the magnetic field outside the ejector, so it's uh, not really clear. But right, but uh, this is also peculiar because uh, the density of the environment is very very low, ten to the minus four per cubic centimeter, which is uh, much lower than what we know for the typical ISM. 
So it's also not clear that we can apply the typical ISM uh, model to this uh, environment. But it's, uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting topic. OK. Uh, <clears throat> so let's say first Newtonian. It's easy. Newtonian. So evolution of the Newtonian blast wave, call, uh, let's say. So just uh, we assume this process is adiabatic. And energy is conserved. So energy of the explosion should be uh, 4 pi, let's say. So ISM, this is the mass of the ISM uh, at the radius r. This is, uh, let's say, this is radius r. So this jet or some uh, ejector sweep up the ISM at, R, at uh, some radius, and total mass is M ISM, and V square. So this is a, the explosion energy is something like this. Yeah, I should probably put the, I should probably, something like this. So M ejector plus. So this is the total energy, right? This mass of the ejector plus ISM times V square. Mass of the ISM when this blast wave expand to radius R. So M ISM is simply So you can see, for example, if very, very early time, this uh, is very small and the mass of the ISM is negligible. So in this case, just the uh, mass ejector is propagating constant velocity V. So this is a, uh, and when this is, becomes comparable, then the velocity should decrease. So I can do this. Let's say. So V starts to decrease when uh, M ejector is comparable to the MISM. This radius course deceleration times deceleration radius, which is uh, just you can this is about uh, So for, let's say this is a kinetic energy of this explosion divided by 10 to the 49 erg. And interacting with the ISM with number of density unity with speed of beta zero, start to decelerate at 10 to the 17 centimeter, which is very, very large compared to this jet physics scale, this GRB scale. Our deck is the radius that this blast wave start decelerate. So up to this point, blast wave is yes. Let's say the shock shock wave. So this is a uh, no the yeah. This is continuously interact with ISM or the radius. 
But at some point, the mass of the ISM is becomes significant compared to the mass ejector mass. Then this uh, blast, the shock wave slows down. Until that time, just this trouble with the initial velocity v. So I can I can get something like this. Let's say t. So. Right, so, so let's say if I brought velocity v, it's constant, v0, until this time, t deck, and slows down. And this phase, let's say, costing phase, we can neglect the ISM. And this phase, the ISM is more important. So this phase we call a set of Taylor phase. Yes, uh, there is uh, information from polarization, polarization of the syn synchrotron radiation. But uh, it's uh, not very clear because it degenerates with morphology of the jet and magnetic field. And so far what we have is just upper limit. We are not really able to distinguish, but uh, if you fix some model, then you can tell the what is the magnetic field, what is the how magnetic field is ordered or random. So after the deceleration, it's, uh, the velocity slows down and uh, how I can calculate this evolution. So now I can approximate So I, I neglect the ejector mass here after T deck or R larger than R deck, then it's good approximation that V is about uh, R divided by T with the order unity correct. Of, so from, for the exact solution, you have the order unity correct, correction. And you can solve this. So R. So after this deceleration, radius increases with t to the two, two fifths, and the velocity is this decrease with uh, t to the minus. So this phase, uh, yeah, let's take put the the name. So this is a set of Taylor phase that uh, my blast wave evolves like self-similar way. And here, decreases with theta minus. Five third, and the radius goes linearly, initially linearly, and then so this is a for the Newtonian case. So after you get, the, for example, this evolution, what you can do is now I know the, how velocity evolves and how many electrons are co collected in this blast wave. So you can calculate, first of all, for the Newtonian case, the internal energy of the shock is about MV. Uh, density of the ISM times V squared. Now I know the evolution of the V, I can calculate the evolution of internal energy so that I can calculate how much energy in electron and magnetic field as a function of time. So in relativistic case, we can do the same exercise. 
Now, what is the what is the equivalent uh, formula for this? Is uh, so energy is uh, mass of the jet. Say mass of the jet. Mass is square. Mass of the jet or ejector plus uh, and Lorentz factor. What order do you know this? Gamma or, yeah, this is actually gamma squared. Why this is gamma squared? Because uh, if you stand at the shock frame, you are standing in the shock frame, so that you are ISM coming to this way, gamma. And this shock dissipates this kinetic energy, gamma, and dissipate. So your internal energy, if you stand at the shock frame, is uh, gamma rho squared. And then again, you boost this in the lab frame, you have another gamma. So that the, for this shock wave propagation, you have extra gamma here. Now you can calculate, and also now let's use the from yesterday, the radius and the observer time related to like this. Radius is gamma square times t. Then now I can do let's say I'll <clears throat> So now I put much, much more energy here, 10 to the 52 ergo and the gamma Lorentz factor of 100. And this start to, start to be accelerated, uh, sorry, decelerated at this radius. So because of this uh, huge, huge energy carried by the ISM, your shock wave decelerated uh, with smaller radius compared to the new, neutron, new Newtonian case. And the, it's more dramatic if you put this uh, time scale. Because of here, I have Lorentz factor squared, which is a factor of 10 to the 4. So now you get, uh, for example, ten second. So even this very, very large kinetic energy afterglow blast wave start to decelerate for observer time about 10 seconds. Then you can do this math, then what you get is, uh, for example, Lorentz factor goes like t, observer time minus 3 over 8 or something. This is why we see usually if you look at the afterglow, it's an X-ray afterglow decline very early time. This is actually means your jet is already decelerated after 10 seconds, 100 seconds when you start to observe the X-ray afterglow. But for the Newtonian case, for example, supernova remnant, it usually goes up because it doesn't really decelerate at, the, at large radius. And time scale also just divided by this by velocity, which is usually 
10 years or 100 years. So it's a very, very different. The, the physics is the same, but very different uh, observ with the observational consequence for Newtonian outflow and relativistic outflow. You see very bright from 10 seconds. On the other hand, you see very, very slowly rising light afterglow for the Newtonian blast wave. And yes, and I took this is uh, this is uh, the, in the case n equal one. How do you know that? So we know, yeah, as she told me that the typical ISM density is unity in the Milky Way. But uh, in principle, we don't know. This is also free parameter. So okay, now so. So far, we have a lot of free parameter, right? This is, uh, we don't know the density. This is a free parameter. And also, we don't know explosion energy. This is also free parameter in theory. And we don't know epsilon E and epsilon B. And usually, relativistic case, because this is so fast, we don't really care the initial Lorentz factor. So initial Lorentz factor is usually not really the matter, but we have already one, two, three, four, three parameters. This one. Oh, this is uh, N here, N, N of the ISM. So N is here. N. Because blast wave, the size is now R, and uh, this is the mass that blast wave collect at the radius R. And the energy in this blast wave, because of this accumulation, is times gamma square c square. So I think I don't have much time. So let me quickly show the how synchrotron radiation. What is the nature of the synchrotron radiation? So, so we are interested in the blast wave dynamics because we, don't, we want to know how, much, what, how the electron energy and the magnetic field energy evolve with time. So now we can calculate internal energy of the shock from this uh, evolution for both Newtonian and relativistic case. Now, given this uh, energy, how can I calculate the synchrotron power? So the synchrotron is a, if you have magnetic field and then you have electron goes around the magnetic field, you emit some, uh, this first of all, this goes like, goes around this circular orbit. And if this is non-relativistic, the angular frequency is, uh, you, you must be familiar with this, uh, written like this, which is about uh, one point. So nice thing for this is called the cyclotron frequency. Nice thing of the cyclotron is uh, Given the magnetic field strength, this is constant. This doesn't depend on the, how fast the electron is. This is nice, but if you go to the relativistic case, and then this case, we don't have any relativistic beaming. So if you look at the, for example, electric field of this radiation, you have this sine curve. This is familiar, like, right? The cyclotron radiation. And synchrotron radiation, and you have worked on a particle accelerator here? Not really. The synchrotron, these are probably, if you are, if you worked on particle accelerator, then you, you are more familiar with this uh, synchrotron and cyclotron than me. So synchrotron is uh, if I have 
is moving relativistically gamma. Then first of all, this omega g is modified by gamma because of the equation's motion. So now my frequency starts to depend on uh, gamma. And also, if I look at this uh, radiation here, as we discussed, this emission beamed. So first of all, radiation beamed in this one over gamma. And also, the arrival time, so the frequency, let's say frequency or arrival time difference is uh, one over gamma square delta t. So because of this, uh, we see just part of this uh, Lorentz cone. And because of this, it's approaching to us. Frequency also affected by gamma square. Synchrotron frequency is actually gamma cube because of this two factors, gamma So this is a gamma square. What? So what I'm saying is uh, if you look at single electron emitting synchrotron radiation, now again, T, and let's say electric field. In cyclotron, I have a beautiful uh, sine curve, but now I see something like this. And this frequency is still omega g. g. So this is a, this frequency. But now this characteristic frequency, this width of this is uh, the synchrotron frequency. So this is gamma square uh, EV. And because of the relativistic beaming, when the electron approaching to us, I have much more str strength and then decrease and then again. So this is synchrotron radiation. And you can calculate this, uh, how electric field behaves with just uh, with the electrodynamics. And you, if you can do this, synchro, this uh, Fourier transformation, you can get the spectrum of the synchrotron radiation. And if this situation, in this situation, nu f nu, because this is maximum, as you say, maximum uh, uh, frequency that I have. So beyond omega synchrotron, I have an exponential cutoff. This is exponential minus omega, minus, uh, sorry, minus nu. And below here, do you know what power is this in the synchrotron radiation? If I look at the single electron and I'm in the orbit of the synchrotron radiation, one third. This is almost true. And uh, actually, if you look at the electron on the orbital plane and the single electron, this Fourier transform gives me two thirds. But uh, as he told, told me, if I have a random orientation, I look at many electrons goes like this, and then sum up all the uh, isotropic uh, distribution, I get new to the one third. So this is, uh, astrophysically, we don't really expect uh, every electron orbiting the single, single plane, and we look at this plane. So astrophysically, we ex ex expect more like new to the one third. So what happened is, uh, this is a 
synchrotron spectrum for the single electron, and I can sum up all the accelerated particle here. So now my electron has some distribution. Let's say gamma minus p. Then I sum up this. Each electron emits something like this. So in the end, just integrate over this power law spectrum. I get the This is one third dominated by low Lorentz factor electrons. And above here, something like this. You can calculate this power law from this and this distribution. So I think I have, I don't have enough time, so I. Let me show you some slides. Oh, yes. Uh, I put wrong figure, but uh, after some uh, integration, you get some thing like this. Yeah, I put the wrong version of the figure, so let me... So actually, in this accelerating acceleration shock, I have an electron distribution from some characteristic uh, Lorentz factor. You can calculate from this uh, energy conservation. And now my spectrum looks like uh, So new M, this is a synchrotron radiation of the, this typical Lorentz factor electron. And if you go to higher and higher Lorentz factor, then synchrotron radiation is so strong that uh, this electron cools down and cannot keep high Lorentz factor. At some point, you have some cut into the minor. So, yeah, B. So, you just, so if you observe the synchrotron spectrum, then you can identify the, what is the free, frequency nu m and nu c, and maximum, free, maximum uh, flux here. These quantities are related to the, the, the param free parameters, something like this. So this typical synchrotron frequency is written by explosion energy and also the magnetic field parameter and the electron parameter. And of course, depend on T. And total power of the synchrotron radiation also, you can write down as a function of energy, density, and these parameters. So, and then you can, if you can identify these uh, quantities from the observation, you can infer what is the energy or magnetic field in this uh, process. Right. So you see, I haven't, I haven't talked about the power of the synchrotron radiation. So power of the synchrotron radiation is uh, in the magnetic field energy density. So because uh, this goes like gamma square, at some point, your synchrotron radiation power is so strong, and then 
within the one dynamical time, your electron lose energy. So there should be some uh, cutoff or cooling tolerance factor. Beyond that, you just lose. You cannot continuously your electron cannot continuously radiate synchrotron radiation. So this uh, frequency defined by cooling frequency. Oh, this P. This one. Oh, P here. Yes. Yes, yeah, it's in, in some sense, this goes like the, goes to here. But uh, this, yeah, it's a, but uh, this is so, this is a uh, steep, so num number is dominated by these electrons. Yes, break, yes, break, this is break. Yeah. So this is a spectrum that we see in gravitational wave event from radio to X-ray. And uh, here is uh, 15 days after the merger, and this is 100, 100 days after the merger. This is uh, remarkable that uh, the single power law index from radio to X-ray. And uh, you can look at this is about uh, 10 orders of magnitude. Uh, not really. <laughs> here, actually, many different frequencies here. And here, also different frequencies. Just I, I put the <laughs> three data points. But actually, this is remarkable that it uh, goes only once. And uh, I think I don't know any other objects produce synchrotron radiation in a single power law spectrum from just 10 orders of magnitude. This is very remarkable for this event. Then the light curve in the radio band is something like this. So in first detection was about two weeks after the merger, and start goes up, 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 and then decline. So this is a this is also not very straightforward to inter interpret this how. As I told you, the light curve of the typical afterglow is just goes, even in the radio, it goes down from at early time. And the X-ray always goes down. And X-ray also, for, for this event, X-ray follows this same configuration. So the interpretation of this is uh, uh, somewhat uh, sort of confused uh, many people, and uh, many people had a different opinion what caused this slow rise. Maybe what we see is just the cocoon material here, and we don't see the jet or something like this. But in the end, so this is the VLBI measurement. So radio interferometer could resolve the motion. So they cannot resolve really the size of the emission region. But this resolved the motion from here to here, from day 75 to day 240. This is, I think, flux uh, level. And uh, because this is, uh, you can calculate from this is 2.7 milliarc second in this time interval. And we know more or less the distance to the source. So you can ca calculate how fast this emission region moves. And you realize that the apparent velocity is faster than speed of light. And this doesn't mean the jet is moving faster than speed of light. So what really happened is, uh, so in a tutorial, I put the how apparent velocity depends on the Lorentz factor and the viewing angle. And you can calculate something like this. So given Lorentz factor, and uh, assuming some, you are seeing this motion from some viewing angle, and what is the apparent velocity that you see? For example, take Lorentz factor of 10, so your apparent velocity behaves something like this. 
there is some peak, and at the peak, your apparent velocity is about Lorentz factor. So because this uh, says apparent velocity of four, four times speed of light, which means, so here, so in order to get the apparent velocity faster than four, you need the Lorentz factor of the gamma higher than four. And also, if you look, if you go to the, so you, you may think, okay, maybe I can explain the jet with Lorentz factor four and here, and then Y viewing angle. But this is not the case because if you remember relativistic beaming, in order to see the emission, you have to be uh, one of a gamma theta within the, this Lorentz cone. So relevant thing is within this peak. So from this, we can estimate what is the delta theta from the emission region, which is about the Lorentz factor is about larger than four, and delta theta viewing angle to this jet is a, a zero, zero point, less than 0 0.25 radian. Which one? Greater. I will show later, yeah. Yes, shock region. So this shock wave moving. And the second important thing is we didn't really see What we see is something moving, not like sphere. We have some, uh, if this emission region is like spherical and moving toward us, we don't, ex we don't expect this motion. If everything is spherical and to moving toward us, just uh, we expect some expansion of the re emission region. But what we see is compact region moving some direction. Yeah, y yes, but uh, because of this uh, constraint on this direction is not so fantastic, so it's not really, but uh, yeah, it's this size constraint is also useful. Yes, yes, it's the hope. But uh, the point is, uh, I think, uh, now it's fainting, so at some point, VLBI should be able to, but uh, the flux is not so fantastic here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a power low jet model. The, these, these curves are from power low jet model. Oh, that is uh, complicated and then I don't really know. This is, depends on the, you know, this radio interferometer, you, ha, you have many radio telescopes, and depending on the condition of each telescope, you get different uh, uh, errors. So I, I don't know why this changed. I think some of the radio telescope was not available for, for this day. Yes, yes. Now the picture is something like this. So we are looking at, and also combining this information, and I have some problem in tutorial. You can calculate from this light curve peak, combining this, oh sorry, information, you, you get the, this sort of density estimate and the total energy. This is not isotropic equivalent, this is total energy in the jet. It's about 10 to the 49 to 10 to the 50 area. Uh, yeah, this is just simple function that try to fit the data. But uh, probably this structure, so yes, what she's asking 
is uh, it's a bit complicated. So I have 20 minutes. <laughs> Let me bit clarify what is the issue here. So what we see, the problem is this slow rise, actually. So if you have only the jet, only you have jet, and looking at the from some viewing angle, and initially you don't see any, almost nothing you see. And then this slows down, and at some point, so gamma, Lorentz factor decreases, and at some point, initially beaming cone is very, very narrow, and slows down, and you see more. So in this, in this case, what you expect is not slow rise, but uh, it's sudden rise, something like this. This is pure jet case. But we gradually, we see some gradual rise, so which means we see something, some structure, maybe lower Lorentz factor, and initially these guys, lower energy, lower Lorentz factor, produce afterglow, and in the end, at the peak here, we start to see the jet. So this sort of uh, picture is called the structured jet. And this origin of the structure is maybe cocoon, maybe jet itself, but uh, in this fitting, I, I just put the power logic. Okay, so, and another interesting thing is, now we can sort of tell you from superluminal motion, this is very sensitive to the viewing angle. So it's uh, interesting to see, it helps sort of the Hubble constant measurement by gravitational waves. So this is a, Hubble constant measured by the posterior constant GW measurement. Sort of a large uncertainty in this dire direction because we don't know the viewing angle. This is, cosa, this is viewing angle. And if we can constrain some, somewhat constrain this viewing angle, you can do this uh, Hubble constant measurement. And actually, this is what we get. Uh, from VLBI and light curve. So this is a gravitational wave uh, constraint for the distance and observing angle. So observing angle goes like zero to six degree for 90% confidence level. And this is a VLBI contour. So this is one for the simplistic model. And this is from like hydrodynamic simulation. Light curve. Yeah. And here is the posterior distribution of the Hubble constant from just gravitational wave and combining with the light curve and the VLBI, the constraint sort of shrinks. But still, this doesn't solve it like between uh, Planck and Schuh's supernova observation, but it's interesting improvement. So in 10 minutes, let me summarize my whole discussions. But so far, some questions. OK, so let me summarize. So we are thinking this process that uh, coming back to introduction that two neutron stars in spiral and emitting gravitational waves and shrinks, so this phase called, we call in, in spiral phase. And uh, I think this number is, uh, yes. So this case, just the two neutron star collapse the black hole just after the merger. So just in spiral waveform and merger and then no uh, gravitational wave after the merger. But we still have uh, some accretion disk around the black hole. This may power some uh, GRB or kilonova. And it's interesting that if you accept the most massive pulsar 
observed. So there are three different uh, fates for the neutron star merger for reasonable mass range. If your mass of the two neutron stars is low mass, then you get the supermassive neutron star. And very heavy case, it's black, just like the previous animation, it goes like black hole. And there is an intermediate uh, state that hypermassive neutron star, which is uh, stable up to 10 milliseconds to one second, then collapse the black hole. Supermassive, and the definition is supermassive black, uh, sorry, super, supermassive neutron star is a neutron star which is supported by solid rotation, uniform rotation, but the uh, mass is ma more massive than non-rotating neutron star. This is supermassive black, sorry, <laughs> supermassive neutron star. And the hypermassive neutron star is more massive than uniform rotation maximum mass, but which is supported by differential rotation and the thermal energy. Supermassive neutron star, it depends on the person. It's, a, it's a interesting that uh, you know, some people use supermassive black hole, some people use supermassive black hole, then you can judge who is the referee of my paper. <laughs> it will collapse if it has magnetic field and dipole spin down, then at some point it should collapse. Yeah, hundreds, thousands of seconds. Yes, so this one, so this is just, we saw, the, after the merger, we don't see any gravitational waves. But these two cases, we expect some gravitational waves. To detect these uh, post-merger waveform waves, very hard, but I think at some point, it may be possible. So, the merger, so eject some material, so this is a simulation for the mass ejection. You see both black hole formation case and the hypermassive neutron star case, both we have uh, some mass ejection. And usually we see the dynamical mass, this is called the dynamical mass ejection, produced by the tidal tail, like tidal tail here, and also shock interaction. This is tidal tail. It's also called dynamical. So collision ejector and the tidal ejector, so we combine. And then after this mass ejection, we expect some uh, jet formation. So now I can show you that some jet propagation. So this is a ejector that produced that the merger. So, so this is also expanding. <clears throat> and at some time, the jet is injected. So it's very quick, but uh, as you can see, I believe this is internal energy. Yeah, this is internal energy, and this is the Lorentz factor in, in log. So here is the jet. <coughs> here is the jet, and this is a bow shock that uh, we call it cocoon. And you can see the expansion of the jet and the cocoon, like this. Oh. Can I stop? Yes. So jet is expanded in, on the axis, this particular axis, and also the, you have some this cocoon material, so which is you can now cl see clearly in the simulation. And the cocoon is more or less isotropic, but jet is still collimated in this way. It's created. So as long as the propagation speed of the jet is not much faster than the sound speed, you have automatically get the, you cannot avoid to form cocoon. But if the jet inside the ejector is much faster than sound speed, you don't have a significant cocoon.
Yes. Yes, the uh, sound speed of the shock duration, which is uh, what one one over square root of three, is the uh, sound speed of relativistic material. These are the situation what we were discussing. This uh, breaks out of the shock, or some off-axis emission can explain this uh, GRB, which observed up at 1.8 second delay and two second duration. And we also talked about uh, this uh, kilonova band afterglow. So this is a time and the flux. And it, it overplot all the infrared optical detection for the kilonova. This is kilonova component. It looks like, like IR rise and optical declines. And here you see afterglow. The time scale of the kilonova is about 10 days and up to months. And then after that, you, we see some uh, rise in afterglow. And as we discussed, this kilonova is powered by radioactivity. And uh, this beta decay process nicely can explain the, this total power of the kilonova. On the other hand, this uh, afterglow, we use kinetic energy and release the kinetic energy through the rock die SM. So this powers. And this time scale is determined by the, when we start to see the jet. And uh, our conclusion is, kinetic, in order to get this luminosity, we need uh, like 0 0.05 solar mass of radioactive material. And also afterglow, kinetic energy that is required to produce this is 10 to the 50 erg. And from superluminal motion, we get the Lorentz factor of about uh, greater than four, at least greater than four around the peak. Yes, yes, yeah? Let me see. First of all, this is X-ray times 10 to the 4. So actually, actually X-ray flux is somewhere here. And optical, so X-ray here, and if you assume power law, optical is uh, somewhere here. So it's uh, very faint compared to the kilonova emission. But uh, at 100 days, it is, there is a detection and uh, more, I think, optical detection. Uh, no, Spitzer is uh, for this component. Spitzer detection is, uh, say, in this, this line. And uh, there is Hubble. Yeah, Hubble is this one. This one. 100 days. It's uh, 70. Okay, so this is a spectrum that uh, we didn't really talk about. But uh, okay, this black one, just look at the black ones. So the black one is observed the spectrum and then try to fit with model. So 1.5 days, this actually quite look like black body. And 3.5 days, you start to see some structure here. So this is uh, because uh, some wavelengths, the optical depth is so large, the photons cannot escape at some, some wavelengths. And at uh, one week, so it's not look like black body. You see more and more atomic feature. So hopefully, at some point, we will be identify some element from the spectrum that is, would, would be very exciting. So now, Just quickly, so this, these are just uh, what we learned so far. And uh, most of the thing I told you is uh, somehow establish the calculations. But uh, we have many, many unsolvable issues. So let me, find, before I finish my talk, just, uh, in, just show you some unsolvable issues that maybe you want to solve. So 
first the central engine and the EM counterpart. So many people want to know what is the merger remnant, black hole or a neutron star, and can we tell the merger remnant from EM counterpart, or we can distinguish black hole neutron star and the neutron star, neutron star from EM counterparts. And we don't know also the how the major remnant produced the jet. And we don't know the role of the magnetic field. And uh, of course, still we have to improve the neutrino physics in the uh, central object physics. And also, in the Kilonova side, there is also an unsolved issue. So this is an interesting uh, plot by Metzger's uh, review. So this is a how peak luminosity changes with uh, time. Time means 1998, 2010. So first paper say, okay, peak is here, very bright. And then Brian wrote a paper, okay, heating. heating he calculated the heating and uh, actually here. And now there are some work about opacity. So because of heavy elements block provide a huge opacity, it goes down. And but Brian and Dan came up with a good idea, okay, let's uh, remove lanthanoid, then it goes up. And actually what we see in this uh, gravitation, this is the picture before the gravitational wave event. So maybe this is, if lanthanoid free ejector is blue and bright, and if it's a uh, lantern and rich, it's a uh, red and uh, faint. And actually, what we see is interesting that uh, here it was bl blue kilonova, but here we need high opacity. We sort of see the transition from here to here in a single event. But now, question is uh, so this is some speculation of the, in this paper. Maybe this uh, blue component is coming from shocked material, but we don't really know what is the origin of low opacity, say, blue component. Maybe light, so this is actually the light r plus element. And uh, so still we have to understand what really produced these two different components. And uh, also, also, the late time kilonova behavior is not really understood. So this is a heating rate as a function of time. And the gamma ray here, red gamma ray, and the electron is this one. And now I add the heavy particles. The fission, fission and alpha decay also contribute around 10 days. This is one possibility, maybe contribute, maybe there is no, there is no heavy element at all. If there is heavy element, they may contribute to the heat. So at the late time, we may be able to see the feature of the super heavy element, but this still, we don't know. And we haven't really done any calculation of the kilonova nebula, which is uh, when the kilonova eject optical depth becomes less than unity. We don't know how such an emission how look like. No, it's a declining part. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, how I mean the spectrum of the late time. And uh, also, we, we want to have a good idea how we can prove the, the neutron star merger really produce R plus elements. So one way is uh, detect uh, nuclear gamma rays, but this is very, very faint, so it's very difficult. So I skip this. Okay, let me, I will finish in, in a few seconds. So, and also we have uh, many issues on the GRB and JET, so like this. So we don't really still know what, so we discussed what is the minimum Lorentz factor required, but still, we don't know what is uh, really the mechanism that creates gamma rays. And uh, also why, so from VLBI, 
we learned the jet is really co narrowly co collimated, but why the jet is so narrowly collimated, and what is the origin of the structure of the jet, and uh, so on and so forth. And thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you mean, hadronic decay, pion, something? Yes, uh, like uh, uh, you discussed beta decays, etc. Also, so uh, can the gamma ray uh, come from those uh, radioactive decays, etc.? The uh, radioactive decay energy is not sufficient to explain the gamma ray luminosity. Total energy is much smaller at one second or this time scale. So it's a, it's a more like electron uh, produces the gamma rays, probably. Yes. Pretty major. When they are like, spinning in spiral, they have high magnetic field. What actually happens to that field during merger? And Pretty major, actually, we don't know really this. Uh, if there are high magnetic field or not. Maybe magnetic field just decayed. Because uh, until the merger, it, there, are, it, there is a long time from the pulsar formation and merger. So during this time, probably magnetic field decay. But when the merger, the mag magnetic field is strongly amplified, then it play a role you know, after uh, all the process, <laughs> yes, it's definitely play an important role in the jet formation, for example. But some of the process is not really depends on the magnetic field. For example, how much dynamical eject I get is not really depends on the magnetic field because it's uh, determined by the shock and the gravitational interaction. But post merger evolution of the accretion disk and jet formation the magnetic field is crucial. So on behalf of ICTS, the organizers, and all the participants, I think we should thank Kenta for this wonderful course. So let's start that. As, as you would have sort of realized, you know, the lectures were amazing because it's a complex subject. It involves many different aspects, starting from GR simulations, radiative processes, complicated astrophysics, but the pictorial way in which he could convey the information, such complex set of information, I think really, you know, all of us enjoyed it. And definitely it is a, also a role model for how you really need to approach this particular subject. So I learned quite a lot and I'm sure everybody would agree that that's exactly what it is. So let's thank Kenta once again. And as you can see, you know, the story is not over. His last few slides essentially tells you that we really don't even know how the gamma ray burst is really produced. Right. So, yes. So, so, there is a lot of research to be done also. So, all of you who are much younger than me definitely have a lot of things to investigate. And I definitely, you know, make sure that you have interacted with Kenta. So, in the future also, collaborations as on pro projects stemming from what is being taught in this particular course would be a nice way to take these things forward. So with that, let's thank Kenta once again. Can, and we hope to see you once again in ICT some other time.